Trinitas Church, we are about to enter into a sermon series on one specific biblical doctrine, the virgin birth. Yes, through this Advent season up until the 25th of December, we will be discussing this doctrine and the many angles at which we can examine it in Scripture. And I want to lay before you this basic concept when it comes to this doctrine of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It makes it clear that in the the presentation of the gospel, there is no waiting pool. There is no easy entrance into this news about who Jesus is and what he has done. The gospel begins at the deep end of the pool. It doesn't just begin at the deep end of the pool, it begins at the high dive, setting before us the most offensive miracle in the Gospels, the miracle that has received the greatest opposition historically over and above all others, and the miracle of which I speak is the virgin birth. There's this saying that there are three stages of acceptance for any sort of idea that is contrary to the way we normally think. First, it's ridiculed, then it's vehemently opposed, and then finally it's accepted as self-evident. It's funny, uh, no one knows who first said this. Sometimes it's credited to the, the uh, very cynical philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer. Other times it's credited to the American pragmatist, believe it or not, William James. It's interesting that um, no matter who you credit it to, the idea is <laughs> that truth is something that's malleable. Friends, this doctrine of the virgin birth has itself been many times ridiculed, many times vehemently opposed, and even when it's widely accepted, it's often filled with misunderstanding and mistruth. With that said, we're going to go to God's Word in prayer to give us insight and wisdom and understanding from His Scriptures. Bow your heads with me. Mighty God, there are things that we profess to believe With such familiarity, sometimes we don't reflect on what we're really saying. Lord, this doctrine of the virgin birth has been in the Apostles' Creed for centuries. It has been the profession of faith of billions. Lord, we pray that you would give us the ability to see this truth in a new light, understand what a powerful imperative it lays before us to either accept Christ and leave our minds behind or to hold on to our worldly wisdom in opposition to the gospel. Lord, we pray that we would be led to the foot of the cross today. In Jesus' name we pray, by your Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, I'm gonna read the announcement of the virgin birth to Mary in Luke chapter one, verses 26 to 38, if you're following along. When we're finished, I'll say this is God's word and you can respond, thanks be to God, and we'll rise to our feet. Praise the Lord for this word. Luke chapter one, verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of Of God. And behold, even your relative, Elizabeth, has also conceived a son in her old age, and she, 
who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord may be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Trinitas, it turns out in the history of reflection on the virgin birth, it's Mary's statement to the effect, How can this be? that has resonated most with the hearers of this story. Whether skeptics or believers, uh, most would agree I couldn't have said it better myself. How indeed can this be? See, the virgin birth is a different sort of miracle. All miracles, in the very nature of the case, are fantastic. When Jesus multiplies bread, when he turns water into wine, when he's able to show up and appear to people and be unrecognized, we all say, amazing. When Jesus performs miracles like restoring the sight of the blind, removing diseases, healing the lame, we say, thank you. I would appreciate extraordinary healing. When we read about expulsion of demons, the calming of the storm by a word, and walking on water and the resurrection itself, we exclaim, powerful. Even when we have the occasional miracle where something ominous occurs and Jesus curses a fig tree, or in midday there's darkness at his crucifixion, voices from heaven, we say frightening. But when we read about the virgin birth, there has been a different reaction in human history. The reaction has been more like, what? Strange. No gospel miracle has evoked such aversion from the human mind. And it's not hard to see why. See, the gospel begins with a topic that makes us uncomfortable. Call it what you want nuptial relations, the sort of things that um, coarse jokes are made of. You might know that um, our swear words uh, in that list of words that you do not speak often have to do with that process that leads to conception. Our swear words often have to do with those body parts that have to do with reproduction. It is this topic, it's this topic that consists of the stuff that insecurities are made of. Many of us have asked at some point in our life, why don't I have a partner? Why don't I have kids? Or have looked at ourselves and said, oh my goodness, I've got kids, but no husband. Look at me. Or perhaps, or perhaps you've observed this sort of phenomenon. So you got married when? And your oldest child is how old? And I can do mental math just like the rest of you? These topics often evoke some of the deepest insecurities in us. And not only that, they evoke cynicism. Friends, when you hear about a young lady who's engaged but has a baby or is herself pregnant, (laughs) it's not hard for the cynic to say, I'll tell you what really happened. And I don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. By the very same right, there are ideals associated with manhood and womanhood that this story seems only to exacerbate as regards our insecurities. Many women have felt like in order to be desirable, they've got to be a virgin. On the other hand, they must be open to intimacy, after which they cease to be desirable. But you're telling me about this one woman who gets to both be a virgin and have a baby? I have already felt that the burdens of womanhood were impossible, and this story makes them only seem more so. This doctrine has been one of the harder pills to swallow for people historically. And we're going to look at four dispositions of opposition toward this miracle, and we will find ourselves in different measures and degree in all of them. And I'll have you know the gospel. It was designed to evoke from us 
these sorts of reactions so that we would be face to face with the Savior who challenges us from day one and does not fit neatly into the world that we've made for ourselves. So we begin with the first reaction. The first reaction of opposition to the miracle of the virgin birth is, you guessed it, outright ridicule. The idea that the virgin birth is a ridiculous lie. Not too long after Christianity became a phenomenon in the world, that was a reaction that um, many had. In fact, one of the great heretics of the early church in the second century, a man named Celsus, he was an Alexandrian Greek philosopher, and he wrote a book called The True Word, one of the first full-on critiques of the Christian faith, and it attacked it straight on in this doctrine of the virgin birth. And do you know what it said? It said Mary was obviously an adulterer. Joseph, very early on, must have just split when he figured out what had happened. And some like works go so far as to even offer names of the man with whom Mary was alleged to have been an adulterer. Uh, one popular name was that of a Roman soldier dwelling in Sidon, which is uh, modern-day Lebanon, not far from Israel itself. And they even named this man. His name was Pantera. Yes, that is what the 80s, 90s uh, metal band is named after, uh, fairly consistent with the genre for the record. And that was the claim. The Jewish Talmud made the same claim, and in fact, the most famous story that uh, was prominent in the medieval period, um, among the Jews in particular, was called Toledot Yeshu, and it was repeated throughout the centuries. It perpetuated the same story about Mary and who she was and what she had done. You can understand why this theory would arise. Um, <laughs> it's fairly simple, and it goes like this. People have unmentionable appetites. Sometimes they act on them. Afterwards, they lie about them because they're ashamed of them. End of story. That's what people do. And the plausibility of it is um, immediate for most of us because that is something we've all done. Is it not? Every single one of us has discovered at some point in our life, somewhere around adolescence, that, um, well, we have appetites, Sometimes we act upon them in a shameful way and then we keep it secret or lie about it. It's inherently plausible. Many of us might even remember the first time we noticed scandalous advertising and it made us feel funny or maybe the illicit things we could see on TV, movies, video games, the internet, you name it. Many of us ourselves are ashamed of premarital relations, lustful appetites that we've even had while married, or the reality of adultery, and the list goes on and on and on. I should say from the beginning, young people, you've got to talk to your parents about these things, and parents, you've got to initiate conversations about these things. Otherwise, we will be perpetuating the same cycle of feeling ashamed, keeping things secret, and moving on. And you know what? As we are given to that behavior, this sort of ridicule of the gospel will seem more and more plausible to us. More and more plausible. What do we say about this sort of opposition and ridicule? We can critique it on many levels, and the critique is rather powerful. The first critique is that, frankly, it assumes that um, the way we are is the way that everyone is and everything must be. That's the starting assumption there, and it's deeply cynical. But the worldview itself is utterly incomplete. It can't explain where shame comes from. Shame implies a divine person whose judgment weights us down wherever we are, and not just us, but all of humanity. The theory admits as much. But the moment we admit the existence of a holy God who is the source of our feeling of guilt, then when the holy God tells us a virgin birth occurred, it's inherently plausible because all of our guilt bears witness to him. Moreover, the theory is itself self-defeating. 
Once you've admitted that we lie to ourselves to hide our shame, then why isn't it the most plausible to say the reason we react with such vitriol to the gospel and even create a false story about it, lie about it, is because we feel ashamed and we don't want this ideal in front of our face, which makes us feel ashamed all the more. In fact, um, frankly, the slightest bit of critical thinking would lead someone to understand that these theories are nothing at all but conspiracies based not in fact. Uh, let me ask you this. If you keep reading the gospel, does Jesus really strike you as the offspring of a mother of low moral character? Is that what you would gather about this man? Does he really strike you, this man who is the founder of, of the greatest converting, sanctifying, and reforming religion on planet Earth, does he really strike you as having had such origins? Even more, if you engaged in the slightest bit of critical thinking, you'd arrive at this conclusion. What would have been the point of recording an uneventful story about a poor woman who committed adultery and became a single mom? What would be the point of recording that story as an original account? The only reason you'd ever write that story down, publicize it, is because in fact, already, masses of people believe that this Jesus is something quite different than an ordinary man produced from a scandalous relationship, but a man with incredible origins. That story bears the marks of being a reaction to a prior story that offends the human mind at the depths of its reasoning. The original story about Jesus is not so easily dealt with as these stories of ridicule would have you believe. This leads us to the second, the second mode of opposition to the virgin birth. And it might surprise you. There were large groups of people who opposed that miracle on the ground that it was immoral. Some of the earliest people to deny the virgin birth, you might be surprised to know, were people who professed to be Christians, specifically Jewish Christians. They were called Nazarenes or Ebionites. And the great apologist Justin Martyr in his dialogue with Trypho the Jew, who's opposing Christianity, says to Trypho the Jew, for the record, friend, even if you don't believe in the virgin birth, note that there are many people of your race who are Christians who deny the virgin birth. It's a very odd point to make. And why did they deny it? Well, the answer goes like this. This group of Jewish Christians, they said this. The Torah tells us that the Messiah will be the son of Abraham just like I am. He will be the seed of David, just like I am. And it's kind of the whole point of this Jewish ethnicity that we are of the family of Abraham and David. We are the nation of Israel, and our Messiah is supposed to have the same dad as we do. All right? So I don't care what any gospel writer says. I'm persuaded about the identity of Jesus, but frankly, it doesn't fit in our family plan to have a Messiah who comes from elsewhere. It strikes us that he's more like an alien than he is the Savior that was promised us. So this group, they had a mangled version of the Gospel of Matthew, took out the parts that suggested the virgin birth, and they had this basic assumption and argument. Wouldn't any real Messiah, wouldn't any real teacher of Israel want to come and affirm our family values, affirm our special identity as a special family of Abraham? After all, the last verse of the Old Testament says this, of the Messiah, he will restore the hearts of the children to their fathers. How could a savior with no real father be the one who does that? This was their thinking. Now, there's an obvious critique to be made here. Uh, Israel's family dynamic was totally dysfunctional. That's what the Old Testament is about. The concept that Jesus would come to just reaffirm that family dynamic would be rather confused. 
(laughs) And by the way, keep reading the Gospels. Do what you want with those first chapters of Matthew or Luke. And um, who is it that kills Jesus but his extended family? Jesus didn't come to keep the Jewish family intact. There's a lesson here, friends. You might never have thought to oppose the virgin birth on the, on the basis that it um, conflicts with your family values. But I'll tell you this, the gospel does conflict with so many of our family values. Your family can be a barrier to Christ. Do you know that? Yeah, it can be. The whole idea of who Jesus was was at first an offense to his Jewish countrymen. The family that raised Christ seemed like a family that had a child out of wedlock, seemed like a stumbling block, not easily accepted. Part of the gospel is that Jesus did not come to preserve our nice, neat, familiar family dynamics. Jesus was clear he came first to tear families in two and make a new family centered around the concept that in Christ we are made sons and daughters of God. Some of you here have had to break with your unbelieving families to have a living faith in Jesus Christ. That is a reality of the people in this room. Some of you have done that. God help us, frankly, Trinitas, If we ever become a place that does not welcome single moms, divorcees, lifelong unmarried people, the same sex attracted, adulterers, people who have ruined their reproductive organs, that's people in the Bible called eunuchs, but who repent and cry out, son of David, have mercy on me. We must be a family that welcomes people who are ready to part with their sins and cry out to Jesus as savior. The fact that Jesus' family was itself very different is the first clue that this is the case. The third angle of opposition to the virgin birth is not surprising and is probably the one that resonates most with us today. It was the concept that it was irrational. I would note that this is important for us Trinitas, because we are Presbyterians, and if there is a ditch that we tend to fall into, it is occasionally the ditch of trying to be far too intelligent, far too smart. In fact, historically, the demise of the mainline Protestant denomination known as Presbyterians was wrapped up with a denial of the virgin birth. In the early 1900s, That is when the mainline Presbyterian denomination in the north, the PCUSA, uh, began to slide into a deep descent of what at the time was thought to be progressive thinking, but would ultimately lead to the demise of the denomination. In the 1900s, there was this incredible optimism about human reason, human achievement, and what we can do together. It was a high point of the industrial age. We were figuring out how to master nature like never before with our brilliant minds, harnessing electricity, making automobiles, the first airplanes, and the birth of the modern city. And there was incredible optimism about what we could do if we all just worked together. In fact, who was the president, anybody know, in 1919, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for helping to form the League of Nations? Who knows who that would be? Woodrow Wilson, and did you know that Woodrow Wilson was a good Presbyterian? Did you know that? Oh, indeed he was. It was around this time that the Northern Presbyterian Church, the PCUSA, they they had split from the Southern Presbyterian Church in, in 1861. That's where our denomination comes from. In 1923, New York Presbytery ordained two recent graduates from Harvard Theological Seminary. These men went through an examination process in a committee like the one that Scott Hedgecock and I sit on. And these two men said outright and frankly, yeah, we don't believe in the virgin birth. We don't think it happened. And they were ordained to the ministry. Your pastor could have been a man who said they didn't believe in this miracle with which the gospel begins. How could this be? Well, the rationale that Cedric A. Lehman and Harry P. Van Dusen 
set before their presbytery and were approved went like this. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. There's no way the truth would want us to be unreasonable. And after all, the virgin birth, it doesn't make any sense. And um, it's actually more useful to us if Jesus is just an ordinary man. He is a, a, an easier ideal to follow after if he's just like one of us. And after all, Jesus' ethical teaching, it remains the same, even if he wasn't born of a virgin, they thought. And not only that, but in this developing age of brilliant people, the modern masses will only embrace a reasonable Christianity. So we've got to remove this stumbling block from the beginning. In fact, there's a real problem if Jesus was born of a virgin. If Jesus was born of a virgin, get this, we are not one big human family. There's actually a whole nother family from a man who has a totally different father. How does that help us in building a league of nations, in being one big human project working together? Jesus stands out as the lone man with a different kind of father. He's a divider, if we think of him that way, not a uniter. Well, this led to a division in the Northern Church, the creation of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. They're kind of like our cousin in the Northern Church, the PCA, having come out of the Southern Presbyterian Church after it went the same direction. Well, the critique was not hard to level against this view. In fact, God's providence leveled it better than anyone, anyone who calls themselves an apologist could. Those who sought to save the human mind by the denial of the virgin birth, would have their optimism about the human mind shattered twice at the beginning of the 20th century by World War I and World War II, because here's what happened. The same human reason that denies the virgin birth was the same human reason that led the Russian people to commit the holodomer, the mass starvation unto death of 5 million Ukrainians in 1931. The same brilliant human mind that can't tolerate the virgin birth compelled the Germans to believe that the Holocaust was a necessary act for the survival of their people. The same brilliant human mind that can't tolerate the virgin birth compelled the Japanese to mutilate 200,000 Chinese citizens in the city of Nanking to make a point. I'm not talking about combatants. I'm talking about civilians. The same human mind that can't tolerate the virgin birth led the allied forces to mercilessly, seemingly unnecessarily bombard Dresden with 1,200 tons of bombs, creating a firestorm in the city that killed civilians. We have plenty of evidence to call into question exactly how deep and profound the thoughts of this human mind really are really happen to be. Friends, the gospel story is unashamed to offend that mind from the outset. And it would have you know that there is not one sort of rationality that all people share. There's a sort of reason that begins with the fear of the Lord as the beginning of knowledge, and that reason will see the virgin birth as salvation. There's another sort of human reason that is proud and destructive, and bears the seeds of its own, its own terrifying effects on humanity. Well, the fourth sort of opposition, remember, we just have four. We saw first, ridicule. Second, we saw that the virgin birth was at odds with our family values. We saw third, that the virgin birth, it offends human reason. But there's another way to oppose something, and it's more subtle. You can oppose something by so badly misinterpreting it that it's not even the same thing anymore. The fourth sort of opposition to the virgin birth is that it, it's a lesson about human achievement. Now, to make the point that I'm making here, consider this. You can affirm a fact, but so badly misinterpret it that maybe it's even worse than denying the fact. Let me ask you this. You're all aware that there are people on planet Earth who are Holocaust deniers. What a terrible perspective to have. 
But is it maybe worse if you say, no, in fact, the Holocaust occurred, but its victims deserved it? Which of those two things are, are, are the more dangerous perspective on the matter? It's kind of hard to say, isn't it? You can oppose a fact by misinterpreting it. I'll give you another example. Suppose someone came up to us and said, Brant, I'm coming to the Lord's Supper today because I believe that it's a means of grace. I said, yes, that's exactly right. And they said, in fact, it's a means of grace because it, it teaches us that we should all diet because there's such a small amount here. We would actually understand that the misinterpretation of the event actually leads virtually to a denial of its real significance. This is what would happen with the virgin birth. Some would conclude fairly early in the church that the point of the virgin birth is that God loves celibate people. And this is true because he loves all those who call on the name of Jesus, but they would respond, no, he, he actually loves them and is pleased with them in a slightly higher way than he is with the rest of humanity. That's why Mary got to carry the Savior. Although she was engaged, she had made a vow of perpetual celibacy, which is a surprising way to go into an engagement. Not all that rational. They say, Brent, in fact, an intercourse is inherently sinful. And of course, that's kind of true because human depravity taints everything. But for that matter, uh, celibacy is inherently sinful because it taints that too. And they say, no, no, Brent. It's because any sensual pleasure is in fact displeasing to God. Therefore, celibacy is the path to an extraordinary level of holiness. That, my friends, is not true. And it is not the message of the virgin birth. What this made for was the church going down a strange bypath from the gospel, changing the significance of this important miracle utterly. The first advance in this step toward total confusion was the allegation that Mary remained a perpetual virgin after she had given birth to Christ. Not only did this mean for many that she never slept with her husband Joseph, which would seem to be a, a rather terrible transgression of her marital vows, but it even led to the doctrine that Jesus never left the birth canal because that would compromise virginity too. Rather, he was miraculously extracted this is the sort of thing that happens when you pervert the truth and you misunderstand its significance. Of course, none of this is true. Jesus had brothers and sisters. The Bible plainly tells us this. The Bible even says that she was kept a virgin until she gave birth, implying that the normal course of events with her husband would have occurred thereafter. But it gets worse. The next step in this bizarre interpretation of the miracle goes like this, that Mary is herself in some way a supernatural mediator between God and man. That she's worthy of prayer. That she might be more accessible than Jesus himself so that in your prayers maybe she would address her first so that then she can address Jesus who can address the Father. In the 5th century, the Athenian Parthenon a temple dedicated to Athena, the goddess of wisdom for the Greek pagan people, was rededicated to Mary. What a curious gesture. And how could it do anything but confuse a populace that she was something like a co-savior? Of course, all of this is contradicted by the scriptures that say there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's no intermediary to pray to in between Jesus and the Father. But it got worse. In 1547, the Council of Trent, in reaction to Protestants, pronounced this. Mary herself must have undergone a miraculous birth, being born without the original sin that we all possess, and herself having never sinned throughout all of her life. She was a sinless woman. And the argument went like this. How could Jesus be born without a sin nature unless his mother also lacked a sin nature? Now, what is the obvious fallacy here, friends? If Jesus could only be born without a sin nature, if his mother lacked a sin nature, well, then what about her parents? And now all of a sudden, it would seem that you have a special line in the human race that was itself never without sin. What confusion. The very worst 
of this sort of confusion occurred in 1950, believe it or not, when Pope Pius XII spoke ex cathedra, that is, in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church, infallibly. And he declared that Mary never died. Death is the penalty for sin. And they'd already established she wasn't a sinner. And so she was bodily assumed into heaven as the argument goes. So we have this parallel savior almost to Jesus Christ. Jesus had a special birth. Mary had a special birth. Jesus was sinless. Mary was sinless. Jesus rose from the dead. Mary never died. This perverse interpretation of the scriptures is tantamount to a denial of its real significance. The critique is this simple, and it starts at the very beginning. If you just kept reading the Gospels, you would never arrive at the conclusion that the celibate are closer to heaven. The spokesman of the disciples, Peter, he's got a mother-in-law. She's referenced a couple times in the Gospels. He's Mary. In fact, those who are closest to the kingdom of heaven are often those who would seem to be more immoral. A woman who is described as immoral, a euphemism for sexually immoral, In Luke 7.39, we read of her this. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, that is, this sinner coming up to him. The Pharisee, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him. That she is a sinner in the sense described. And Jesus said to these men, you gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. And she anointed my feet with perfume. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This woman she had become a member of the kingdom of God in spite of her past and by faith alone and not by any efforts toward becoming another Mary. Jesus himself, he would not be the savior the Bible presents him to be unless that infant had experienced all the trauma of exiting the womb. The boy Jesus experienced all the burdens of being raised by sinful and sometimes unperceptive parents as we read in Luke chapter 2. The adolescent Jesus grew up with brothers who did not believe in him. Biological brothers who shared a house with him. The man Jesus would grieve his father's death and his mother's all too human worries. The dying Jesus would entrust to John the Apostle his mother to be cared for as she grew old and eventually died. The import of the virgin birth, my friends, is that a divine person took on human flesh to suffer our plight from day one. To have a daughter of Adam as his mother, as do all of we. The gospel, friends, is that Jesus came into this world by a miracle of life to suffer the curse due to this world in his people's place unto death only to conquer our greatest enemy. In another miracle of life, the resurrection. And he alone, he alone is the centerpiece of those divine miracles of life. But make no mistake, I hope it is clear to you that this gospel of Luke opens with a thunderbolt, an imperative that you better buckle your seatbelt and get ready to lose your mind, your pride, your belief in humanity, and even your cynicism. It is these very things that the virgin-born man came to kill from day one. So whether you are a believer or an unbeliever in this room, I will simply lay before you these imperatives. If you carry on in unrepentant sexual sin, you will begin to read this story like a cynic. If you carry on believing in the pride of your own mind, you will begin to read this story like a skeptic. If you carry on in the comfort of your own moral condition, you will pass over this story as unhelpful and unuseful. And if you carry on, 
confident that you're extraordinarily spiritual, you will read this story as an invitation to asceticism and a mystical path of self-denial. Only if you admit yourself to be a hopeless sinner will this story be the beginning of wisdom unto salvation for you, and I do hope. If you're an unbeliever with us today, that would be you. Receive Jesus as Savior today. Bow your heads with me. Lord God, your word, the good news, this news of victory and salvation that changes the world, it begins with a thunderbolt and an imperative, and Lord God, we are blessed to have it set before us again today. Disabuse us of our mistaken ideas about how we are to reason our mistaken ideas and our mistaken plans about how we might even build our own families. Lord, I pray that we would be amendable to a church where there is one complex family, but at the same time, one holy family. Because God is our Father, Christ is our Savior, and your Spirit indwells us. Living God, I pray that we would be a people who could embrace Mary and Joseph. I pray, Lord God, that we would be a people who understands we have an imperative to give and to bless children who have no families. And I pray, Lord God, that we would understand this to be utterly consistent with and even an imperative from the gospel we profess to believe. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, by your Holy Spirit, amen.